Copying. It happens all the time in architecture, whether it's finding inspiration in the work of others or explicitly making multiple versions of the same thing. They say it's the sincerest form of flattery. Oh, I'm so flattered. Copying is even baked into our DNA. It's how we reproduce and it's how we learn. But with all this copying can come some murky territory when the expectation for originality encounters unscrupulous idea thievery. In this video, we'll explore when architects copy, when it's productive and clever, and when it's just lazy and malicious. Stay tuned. Hello, welcome to the channel. My name is Stuart Hicks and I teach architecture design studios and lecture courses at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Sometimes I really like when architects copy and make references to other buildings. I liken it to the way that Quentin Tarantino references other films inside of his own films. This kind of referential mining of history to create new works, you know, it kind of caters to insiders. Tarantino is a filmmaker's filmmaker. You can either know where these references come from or not but this does change the way that you view the work. Tarantino famously worked inside of a video store before becoming a director. Because I used to work at this video store for five years, I was behind the counter charging people late fees, <laughs> recommending movies and stuff. And so he has an almost encyclopedic knowledge of past films. Viewers of his movies might not know all the references that he incorporates, but Tarantino is such a good filmmaker that it doesn't even matter. You can appreciate the film on its own as a great story. But if you do know the references, you enter into another world of appreciation and nuance, links to the past, and hidden Easter eggs. This occurs in architecture too, and it can be met with praise or frustration and scorn. Some people call this kind of insider appeal navel-gazing, making designs that only few can understand and ignoring the needs of the world at large. Or it might lead to outright copying, leading to lawsuits and copyright infringement. But when done well, I think it can be part of creating some of the richest and the most engaging buildings that not only respond to their context, but also thrust you into a world of history and memory. Copying is a complex endeavor, and there are all sorts of copying in architecture. The Beaux-Arts model of architectural education was built entirely around students drawing and copying the masterful designs of past architects. The idea was that through enacting the process and the actions of those masters, students would gain a feeling for and practice with the rules that govern their designs. The idea that architects copy, I think, clashes with the expectation that each building should be considered a unique prototype and that each building should be a perfect reaction to the needs of the interior married against the thoughtful response to a context. And in this way, copying feels antithetical to the genius of architectural design at a really fundamental level. But in between the idea that buildings can be copied ad nauseum or that each is a unique snowflake, I think are some really interesting examples to look at that can help us to think about the importance and the usefulness of copying in the design of buildings. Sometimes copying might be a means of creating a building that fits into or relates to its surroundings by copying certain aspects of nearby buildings into the new construction. Such is the case of the Sainsbury Wing in the National Gallery in London. It takes the column from the building it's attached to and it copies it so many times and in so many ways that it stops looking like the original column. You have one exact copy, but then you have these squared off versions that they just start to pile up at the edge of the edition. But copying can also be a way to fit into a much broader context within the history of architecture itself. And so sticking with Venturi, with examples like the Vanna Venturi House, are a cacophony of samples from a grab bag of architectural history. The overall shape is very house-like, even though it isn't produced by a gabled roof. Rather, it's shaped that way only to look similar-ish to its neighbors. But then you have things like the window to the kitchen, which is long and narrow, like the ribbon window of the Villa Savoie by Le Corbusier. And when Le Corbusier used this, he was producing a new kind of window when he stretched it sideways into a long ribbon. Regardless, most architects know the story of how it came to be, and when it's used elsewhere, will immediately associate it with that original. Where the gable copies other buildings in a very general way, the window is a very specific reference to a very particular house. And in order to fully understand the games being played and the changing of the elements, one must be familiar where the original came from. I love watching videos of all the Easter eggs in episodes of WandaVision, and I appreciate doing the same thing with buildings. Then we have examples like the Howard Kronberg Medical Clinic by Arm Architects in Australia. They literally took a page from a book that had an image of Venturi's mother's house and moved the page during the scanning process. Then they produced a building from the 
the scan itself with the streaks, the blemishes, the errors and everything. It's a copy of a copy of a copy. That sure is dedication to copying. That firm, Arm Architects or ARM Architects, even went to the source and made a direct copy of the Villa Savoie itself in the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies. Then they colored it brown. They claim it's an understanding of a local version, an inversion, a reflection of Aboriginal architecture, culture, or perceived attitudes. Another example of a Villa Savoie copy is by Rem Koolhaas in the Villa Dalva, which is basically the equivalent of taking the Farnsworth House by Mies van der Rohe and sandwiching it below the Villa Savoie by Le Corbusier. Here, the elements like windows aren't necessarily challenged. Rather, it's the overt use of the entire building itself that becomes pretty striking. However, the materials have been changed pretty drastically, and the smooth white facade of the Villa Savoie gives way to the utilitarian corrugated metal facade and construction fencing holding people up on the roof. Architects have copied things from outside the history of architecture as well. People like Frank Gehry have made buildings in the shape of binoculars, a perfectly scaled up pair of binoculars. And while this is one of his most overt copies, Frank Gehry has other examples with various levels of abstractions like his fish. Frank Gehry himself isn't working in a vacuum, and these experiments themselves owe their gestation in the work of an artist named Klaus Oldenburg, who would famously create artworks of familiar objects, supersize them, and put them into unfamiliar contexts. So Gary is copying his friend Oldenburg by copying binoculars. For Gary, though, the copying isn't necessarily an end in and of itself. Rather, it's a means to an end. And the fish doesn't really look so much like a fish anymore. And it allowed Gary to invent new ways of evaluating objects based on the complex curvature that one takes. It also prompted ways of solving the problem of trying to fabricate these kinds of complicated forms, which leave the world of traditional building construction techniques. So armed with these new interests, Gary moved on to creating buildings out of swooping shapes, devoid of their initial starting point of trying to look like something else in particular. Of course, now Gary might be said to be copying himself when various buildings start to look alike, when the swoopy shapes are a ready-made solution to almost every problem of building that he encounters. This starts to become a style, a word that most architects try to avoid today. If it's only one architect working in this particular style, it's usually called a signature style. The binoculars might be similar to replicas, like one might find in places like Las Vegas or in China. China has their own Ronchamp, for instance. This is a copying of buildings, done in such a way that isn't trying to be a new interpretation, and it isn't hiding the fact that it's a copy. That doesn't mean it can't be used to create new experiences, though, and places like New York, New York, and Las Vegas are really similar. This is a case of a New York-themed environment, like a concentrated version of it built somewhere else. In addition to replicating certain architectural landmarks, like the Empire State Building or the Chrysler Building, there's also a 150-foot Statue of Liberty, a feat unto itself. There are also themed restaurants and room titles taken from the East Coast city. The art critic Dave Hickey wrote about fake honesty and honest fakery, and makes the distinction between places like Las Vegas and Santa Fe, New Mexico. Each one of these cities are made up of new buildings that try to look old. But in Santa Fe, these older buildings are meant to try to fool you into thinking that they're genuine, while the Las Vegas versions are upfront about being a spectacle made out of copies. Dave Hickey prefers Las Vegas. Of course, copying isn't always so overt, and architects find influence all around them. But sometimes it's more than that. Steals a riff from a song that in the news constantly. Yeah. Steals and make it on you HBO. Made it they steal and you put it on television. Yeah. What do you yeah. say? When Joe Rogan accuses Carlos Mencia of stealing jokes, Mencia claimed that they have just been unconsciously filtered into his brain, only to come out as identical tellings of the same punchline. Sometimes this happens in architecture too. One of the weirdest is from a competition in the 1990s for the IB Museum of Art and Technology. Two entries, one by the architect Thomas Leeser, and then the other by the architects Diller and Scafidio came in looking really similar. Each featured flowing singular folding surfaces. The surface bends around to create the different spaces inside. And in this instance, no one of the architects claimed original authorship. But I think the responses of the architects are really telling. Thomas Leeser says that it's in the zeitgeist. If we copied anything, we copied our own work. Liz Diller says the only way to avert the problem of plagiarism is to be a moving target. If your work is copied and that upsets you, it means you waited too long to move on. 
One of the few instances of copying that led to a lawsuit was after the unveiling of the replacement for the World Trade Center towers. David Childs of SOM was sued by a former student over the new building design. The student design in question was a result of a thesis project here at IIT in Chicago, and Childs was his thesis advisor. While the designs do look strikingly similar, and I do think that Childs probably did rip off the design, I'm not sure that a lawsuit where this complicated of issue of copying and plagiarism will get resolved. In response to a similar incident by Shop Architects, they say that there's so much rich activity going on at schools. It's hard to not be influenced by it. With so many influences and so many echoes, authorship is rarely a simple question. The design in question was pretty simple, and I have to be honest, it's the exact same shape as the columns at the school where I teach at UIC. So to claim a shape as intellectual property seems pretty dubious to me. But either way, I'd love to hear what you think. What are some other ways that you think copying plays into the built environment and the way that it's designed? Let's discuss it in the comments below. Do you have some favorite building copies? While you're down in the discussion section, please consider giving this video a like and subscribe to the channel. If you enjoyed this video, you might also appreciate a few more on the channel. And be sure to come back often because new videos are added every week. See you later.